Yeah, wait that. So, Sego, everyone. Um, Sego is going to go with Sego Cuego. Thank you for coming uh, and welcome to this conversation. It will be the last of the New Moon Dialogues as sponsored by Arts Build Ontario in uh, partnership with uh, myself and JP Longboat towards the Indigenous Creative Spaces project that we have been working on for three years. Um, and uh, and we're, we're just excited to about to launch a report about it all. And um, and really just uh, grateful that we have had the pleasure and um, uh, you know the the humility to work with such amazing artists as those that are joining us today over the last three years in conversations about important conversations uh, towards the arts ecology, Indigenous arts ecology in general, but certainly today's talk on uh, the training and professional development of Indigenous artists, as well as, you know, taking those taking those actions into places where artists feel comfortable and welcome and understood. Um, and so I'll just uh, say I'm Terry Lynn Brennan. I live on Wolf Island off the coast of Kingston. Uh, my family comes from Six Nations of the Grand River and uh, Britain. I do identify of mixed heritage and I'm uh, very glad that you all could join us today on this uh, on this. Can I say overcast as opposed to smoke hazed um, day in uh, in Ontario? Um, I'll pass it over to two of our guests. We do have a third guest. Hopefully, will be joining us, but we'll certainly uh, certainly get things rolling with our two guests. Uh, and uh, Brafni. Tanse, hi everyone. So happy to be here. Um, my name is Brafni Caribou. I am uh, I'm Swampy Cree and Irish, and I'm coming to you today from Toronto in my home. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Hi. Fabulous. Sandy? Sego, Tewaguego. Greetings, everyone. I'm Santi Tagalunyakwa Smith, and I am here in Oswego also known as Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. And I'm also happy to be here and be a part of the discussion and part of the, the last discussion. And I was there when you came to um, the Woodland Cultural Center a few years ago. So it's nice to continue the conversations. Yeah, we. Yeah, we, Santi, Santi, thank you. And Rose, yay. <laughs> Rose, you're on mute. <laughs> this is my my third Zoom today. I think my, I'm a little blurry. <laughs> it's only one o'clock and I'm all blurry uh, in my head. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm coming to this meeting from Toronto to Toronto. Um, I'm doing this from my home because Things are a little busy in the office, so it would be very noisy. Um, I'm the artistic director of the Center for Indigenous Theatre, and, um, uh, and I'm happy to see all these all these people here today. And um, to see Santi and Brefni. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Rose. Uh, yes, it's wonderful to have everyone join us. And I'm deeply humbled for the three of you to join in this conversation because each of you has an, such a unique ex, you know, experience with this these conversation, the conversation we're about to have. So I'm excited to kind of start you off and feel free to just continue with the conversation as the three of you uh, see fit and uh, how it fits into the, the world that you do uh, occupy and, and move through at this stage of your artistic journey. And so I'll just say, you know, uh, how do you work within the current Indigenous arts ecology across Ontario? And let some one of you kick it off. I can start. <laughs> I um I am the artistic director of Gahawi Dance Theater, and Gahawi means to carry in Gangeha. Um, we're based in Oswego, Six Nations, and Dagalondo. 
Toronto. Um, and I um, mostly am a full-time artist. And so that's the focus of uh, accessing creativity, uh, indigenous dramaturgy, um, creation is the focus, process is focus. So it, for me, it's the, um, it's process, 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 which also leads to some professional development and how do we work um, and how do we create and what is important for, for our storytelling, uh, for our embodiment. And most of what we're exploring is not um, available for uh, teaching in a way. So it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of research cultural research, creative research, research in land. Um, so through my creation process of producing embodied works, installations and multimedia works, there's at least a, a year to two to three years of research that happens in community in collaboration with artists and um, devising, exploring and um, cultivating our teams. And so for me, that's a lot of, um, again, just as I mentioned, process and investigation with the focus on accessing creativity. And um, I can talk later about some of the training programs that we offer. Uh, had offered in the past and the professional development programs that we offer now. Yeah. Um, so hello. Um, well, because we are a school, we're not a producing company. Um, we're a training organization. Um, so we, we start from often we just start from where the students are. And so what we find is that most of the students that come to us do not know very much about their own culture. Um, the last few years, um, especially during COVID, um, it was, um, interesting to learn that although some of them actually spoke their language which was fantastic they actually didn't know much about their culture so um that was that was um a big a big learning experience because usually having a language sometimes comes hand in hand with having um uh, a great deal more knowledge of their culture. So um, I have to say for us every year, it depends on our students uh, where we start. So, um, and right now our, our, our group is mostly Plains Cree from Alberta and Saskatchewan. So um, working with elders, uh, just to get comfortable with talking about their culture was where we, we began. And of course, um, when we go places uh, like to Anmatadze, where they meet other people who are seated in their culture and working from their, from their culture base, um, working with uh, Sid Bob and Penny Pucci. And of course, Penny and Sid come from different cultures, but how they work together and they're, of course, they're married, but they're, but how they have built this programming uh, from their home uh, around culture, but also it's all arts-based and it's all culture-based and meeting other people from that territory. So the Anishinaabe territory um, is where they're learning most, but we do, when we have um, a large amount of students from a particular culture, we do try to bring in elders who um, are from their culture as well. 
Um, so, so that's where we start. And um, I don't know if anyone wants to ask me a question about that because I'm kind of, I don't know if I went off on a tangent, but really it's about getting our, our new, our students comfortable in just around culture because they, they're not, um, they haven't come from that, that base. And if there are a couple that do, um, then they are very helpful in, with grounding the students that know very little about their culture. I can hop in and say um, that uh, how I am a part of this ecology in Ontario is as a performer, uh, creator, educator, and facilitator. So I that's how I uh, make my way and uh, through the through the various systems, academic institutions, productions, um, often as, uh, as an individual, I don't have uh, an organization. Um, it's still just little old me. Um, but yeah, I'd say that's how I, how I interact with the, the ecology in Ontario. That's great. Thank you all um, for that. And so to kind of now tease that apart a little bit more. Um, I'm thinking now about your training and the curriculum that perhaps you either offer or have been trained under. Um, and how do you use that to connect with community? I'll let anyone want to start off with that. Um, well, I guess I'll go first. Um, so is the question about my own training? Uh, I would say more CIT, but okay. sure, I'm, I, I would wanted, love to I even know more. To I would love... <laughs> <laughs> but you can talk about your own training. No, no worries there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, I'm Well, I mean, I was trained at, uh, both at York University and at Native Theater School. Um, and and on the road, as everyone knows, when you're on the road, it's a great training ground um, when you're touring and working. But um, we are a curriculum-based training program. We have a, um, a three-year curriculum-based training, and the fourth year, um, the fourth year student will work with us on creating their curriculum. Um, because it's project based. Mm -hmm. um, so we offer, you know, voice training, movement training, dance training, uh, scene study training. Um, so those are the, the basics in theater training. Um, but we also have circles and uh, cultural training. Um, we have um, singing with um, indigenous guests, drumming. Uh, we have we have a project guests, so uh, people will come in for a week uh, and work with our students. Um, whether it's a, a Cree based workshop, which was our last big one um, with Cheryl Rondell. Um, and Cheryl will be coming back in September just for a few days to uh, do her light TP. Um, we, um, we, we love sharing that with our students and our community so much. So uh, we've invited uh, Cheryl and Joseph Natauha back to Toronto. Um, but Yes, so we are curriculum based because we are a school and um, we have to answer to our funders um, exactly what we do and what um, our goals are for each student for each year. Um, so having a, um, a de well-defined curriculum 
Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn that off. Ah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, um, so uh, now I'm, I've lost my train of thought, but if you have any questions about that, um, let me know. <laughs> Thanks. I'm happy to, to say a little bit. Um, and I can actually, I was just reminded, speaking a little bit to where I come from and my training, which was all Western academia, institutions, theater schools. Um, but when I went to York University and I was there doing my master's, I decided to um, make my thesis about um, uh, indigenous artistic practices and training because <laughs> because I when I showed up to York University, I was like, oh, I really don't like this. I've made a big mistake. Um, and there was something about this conservatory model of training that really uh, it it shifted something inside of me. So rather than um, you know take off, which was my first instinct, my wise thesis advisor, Michael Gray Eyes, was like, well, then make it about that. Figure out why um and talk about it and so that's what I started to investigate and actually as part of my master's thesis I wrote about an experience the experience that I had um taking a workshop with with you Santi and Gahawe Theater and that was like a part of my understanding of like different ways of of training different ways of of uh of learning and experiencing um like artistic practice uh, and so I hold that memory very fondly in my in my mind. And uh, and so, yeah, so that's kind of where I came from, where I started to realize it's like there's something about this way of working that really is not working for me. Um, and shifting into what I offer as I walk into any given room, um, I'd say maybe it's like a facilitator and educator, um, some of the things that I've tried to pick up on because I still feel very much as if I'm building that practice. Like I, I, I'm very much in the incubation stage, I feel. I always feel like I'm maybe one teaching ahead or like one teaching outside of a ripple from like any person I might be working with because I'm still figuring out and changing and, and developing what it is that I consider my practice to be. But recently it's been a lot about um, releasing the pressure of, of, of time um, and the idea of being product driven. So like these uh, notions more specifically to do with uh, like capitalism. And it's like, no, I, something I learned in, in the workshops that I've, I've done and the, the rooms that I've worked in and um, the people that I've worked with within indigenous circles from, from, for years um, was this kind of things taking, being very process oriented and not rushing and having the time for something to change and something to shift and something to grow organically as opposed to, uh, I mean, sorry, especially because often the material or the stories that we want to tell are, are precious, are, um, are spiritual, are um, traumatic. And so putting that under a, a pressure cooker of time is just a, you know, potentially a recipe for, for disaster and for harm and for hurt. And so as an educator and facilitator, that's one of the things I really try to focus on. Um, and, and in part is this idea of like letting go of that because, uh, because there is no, um, because it's oftentimes more harmful than helpful and 
if the product that you end up with at the end of the day um, is hasn't been given the time to really settle in the body, find its way um, to be realized in a healthy um, and grounded way, then it's not going, then what's the point of having made it in the first place? <laughs> End of thought. Here, here. Yeah. I really like that. Um, letting go of things. And um, I am uh, very uh, strong advocate for lifelong journey of learning. So the more that you know, the more you realize you don't know anything. <laughs> and so it's, it has to become about process because it's always seeking. And I think as artists, uh, we're seekers, at least I, I feel that uh, personally here in, in inquiry, questioning, um, and is never about, for me, about a product and it's always um, ongoing. So that's, that's um, important. And for the professional development that I program, especially is process-based and hopefully the people who come to it will spend some time in the process that we're exploring and then take that as tools for as they move forward in their artistic practice and journey. Um, I'm not giving a curriculum. I'm not um, devising this is how you become this or this is how you become a dancer or artist, um, everybody has their artistic journey and that is a part of it. And if I'm able to facilitate that in some way or offer some, some tools for people and some new insight, then I think that's, that's what I'm excited about or invite them into my process and then they can, you know, experience that. Uh, so Kahawi Dance Theater, um, in the past, we, we offered a four-week training program, and I called it a training program. We did that for about eight years because we did intensive um, four weeks, and I brought in instructors from all disciplines, mostly dance-focused, um, Indigenous dance, uh, different alternative dance training styles, muscle and bone, body and mind, buto dancing, just everything that I wanted as an artist to be able to have the capacity and the experience of working the body in that way, I, I tried to bring them in. And that was, um, that was successful to a point because one thing I wanted to mention about my experience of training, I trained at the National Ballet for eight, six years, and I trained in ballet for about 18 years. Um, so I, and then I have a degree in kinesiology at McMaster University. So I, I really understand um, the body and the capacity of the body and the f and and um, the fact that you actually you do have to train the body. The body, and as we know, will fall out of fitness in very fast. Like I think it's like two weeks. You could be like at your top form, and you stop training. Two weeks later, you're back to <laughs> square one. <laughs> square one. So so that is just a knowledge um, that we have to have about when we're training the body, it takes an investment. Um, and um, so we're, which becomes the dilemma for indigenous dance training because there is no uh, specific three, four year program conservatory or not, or indigenous um, model or not. Um, which is physically training training dan dancers. Um, so my journey in train uh, creating that training program, I did go through that whole process of oh, what if we became a dance training school? 
and we did a whole strategic plan or investigation about it. And then I said, no, that's not possible because that's a whole other thing that um, I was not prepared as a working artist focused on my own creativity to take that on. Somebody else might be able to take that on. So I left that aside. And so now the training that we do is much more um, professional development uh, focused on um, emerging to professional dance artists, multi multidisciplinary artists, um, people who are um, indigenous or non-indigenous who are looking for different models of learning and experiencing and creating with a strong focus on um, natural pathways and indigenous dramaturgy and working in creation in land. So that that's different than um, cultural land-based work. It's, it's how to work in creation in alignment with um, natural force, with sight, with um, the energies of the, the land. And so that's what I'm focused on now. Um, but but there, uh, everything that I've said sort of raises a lot of questions about how do we train and what, what's needed for training the body um, and um, sort of like the missing access that's out there for young people in particular who want to become professional dance artists and maintain their indigenous um, practices. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And I love the segue that because uh, of talking about land-based um, training that you brought up, Santi, because I think that's that's a great way to go. But first, JP is asking Rose to talk a little bit about CIT's involvement with the Indigenous Arts Knowledge Exchange program, if you're able to. Um, well, it's really recent, um, JP, so um, I can't really speak too much about um, our, our relationship. I think um, it's just um, um, our managing director, Michelle, met some people from there and um, developed a relationship just recently. So we haven't had um, really an exchange yet. So, um, so more on that soon, I hope, to, to share with you. <laughs> But so, I, yeah, does that answer, Terry? I think yeah, it's a watch this space. But but, uh, but uh, what what do you hope to accomplish though, Rose? I mean, there must be some goals that have been set out. Well, I think um, I don't know yet because um, so a lot of things happen um, outside of my knowledge. So when um, our managing director goes out and meets people and develops her own relationship with them, um, and that's really, really new, um, I'm not actually up to date on what her hopes are when she develops that relationship until we get together. And, um, and to, to be honest, perhaps Michelle doesn't know what she hopes to accomplish except just to build relationships. Um, cause that's something that Michelle really, um, is always wanting to build relationships. So, um, and that, that's a, a big part of, um, you know, our community is trying to keep, um, our ties with many different organizations, um, alive and well, we, we do try and, to um, see how we can help each other. So I think that's the goal, but I, I don't know anyone from in the Indigenous Arts Knowledge Exchange. So um, here on uh, this platform, I'm letting you all know, I know nothing about this. <laughs> so I can't answer any questions about it. I don't, uh, I don't even know 
who's involved with the Indigenous Arts Knowledge Exchange. And that's totally fair, Rose. It's uh, it's a new organization that's on the landscape um, that uh, Chris Creighton Kelly and um, France Depronier are involved in. So um, I think again, yeah, it's a but, watch this space. But in fairness, I, JP, I will I will be learning more about that soon. <laughs> okay, Rose. Thank I've, you. I, I appreciate that. I guess I'm just trying to get to some of the systemic challenges that CIT has faced over the many years. Yes, yes. Well, you know, um, I think one of the things that Santee was talking about, which is interesting um, with regard to just, there isn't um, an indigenous training place for dancers um, and that um, indig indigenous individuals need to go other places to find their training. Um, and even at CIT, we have trouble maintaining an Indigenous choreographer or movement teacher because the dancers are busy dancing and they're, they're busy working. So, um, so what you find is um, some of our dancers are ending up in programs uh, which are awesome, but you know, some of our students were at the Citadel this year uh, for a for workshops, and but but they're not at they're not in at Six Nations working with Santee, right? And they're they're not at Bamp working with anyone else. So um, my goal is to really try and find ways to get dancers, even on a short term basis, working with CIT. So our students really have some clarity on, on what it's like to work in, in this embodied way. I have such great admiration for the work that Santi has done, especially with Monique Mojica and uh, with that embodied movement work that Brefni speaks about as well. Um, about that embodied movement, vocal work that is so um, integral to telling our stories. And so having indigenous choreographers and movement people, um, I think is essential for that. And um, I'm not, uh, claiming that the dance teachers that we have presently aren't wonderful. They are wonderful, um, but there is a different, it's different. And we know it immediately from when we're working with, you know, with Penny Cucci, when we're working with Penny at on the Tazi, it's, and with Sid Bob, it, that movement work feels different than what, what we are doing in our, you know, weekly classes at CIT when they're not indigenous. Um, so I just wanted to to go back to what um, Santi and Brefni were talking about in terms of the embodied the embodied work that entails our stories and the movement and our voice and our songs. Yeah, great, Rose. Thank you. And I mean, with the legacy of CIT, it's, um, you know, it's been around long enough in the sense of trying to continue to work within the colonial system um, and, uh, and stay in Toronto in a way that uh, allows it to, to continue to evolve, um, as you say, to meet the needs of the students that are there, um, which is not necessarily how most educational institutions work. So, um, so that's brilliant. Um, thank you. And um, so, if we if we can just kind of maybe continue on, then that um, you know, JP also asks uh, of Santi, like, what form should our training take? And 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 in thinking about that, um, how do you each define land based um, training? Okay, sorry, I was just looking at the chat. So, <laughs> um, 
Um, it's, it's interesting because I don't have the solution for what is the right way for us to do training. Um, and, but now I'm reflecting, when I reflect back oh, about uh, when I was thinking about training more when I had the, the, the summer dance intensive, I, um, and then listening also to Rose and um, the in understanding as Indigenous students um, or young or emerging people interested in be pursuing the arts um, where they have little access or they're living very far north. And there's, and, and then I also get, um, you know, uh, people, mess parents messaging me, my daughter is really into dance, where can she train? <laughs> so the question comes up to me a lot, where can we train, where can we get training? Um, and uh, so a couple of things, when I um, respond to the parents, I, all I can say is, find a great teacher <laughs> you know like the closest school that like the importance is the tr the, the quality of the teacher um, and the the training program and, and, and unfortunately for dance we get a lot of sort of like um, uh, money making dance studios who really are not concerned about quality training they're concerned about how much costumes they they can get their kids into and the the form is not um, you know, it's actually dangerous. Like, you know, like they're they're putting on toe shoes when it's like you should not be wearing, you know. So so there's there there's that uh, option of well, where do people train at a young age? Um, and that, you know, um to build. Uh I don't have the answer or I don't people coming from all across Canada, I don't know. Um and then as I was thinking when I, I remembering, um, I think it's about devising the possibility of devising a very specific training plan. Almost like when we say, you know, if we have an up and coming, beautiful potential, say dance artist, what what is the plan? What is the training plan for them? And but then who is going to do that? Like who is going to be responsible for? Okay, so you, this year you need to go to um, you're going to go to do um, uh, a secondment with um, Sid Bob and Penny. Uh, this year you're going or the next six months you're going to go and do an intensive with Monique Mujica. And this you know like so sort of crafting and going out to, because we're all spread across Turtle Island and internationally. Um, oh, this whole year, you're going to go to New Zealand and train with uh, Atimira Dance Company, or you're gonna understudy, or you're gonna just take classes. So there is potential, I think, there's, there's potential for devising plans for people. Um, because right now there's not one stop shop training where people can get all that together. Um, and um, I think that that for me seems like a possibility or even they going to do um, uh, two, three years of a, a Western based conservatory but they're also doing these other courses to supplement. Um, because as I mentioned, you have to be consistent with the, the physical, physicalness of working with the body. That's, that's, you know, if I was back into focusing solely on training, that would be maybe some of the areas that I'd be looking into. Um, mentorships and uh, secondments and um, as we craft our artistic journey, we can craft a, a training journey as well. I don't know if that's helpful.
And uh, how do you define land-based training? Oh, land-based training? For me, it's about um, process. <laughs> process with the land so um it is exploratory it is really about listening um it's about decompressing and releasing uh so there's there's a process of working for 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 me there's a process of working in land and i worked in our traditional homelands in upper state new york of of releasing um, almost not like I wouldn't say purification, but I would just say like a decompression from the everyday life or getting um, the body and mind in tune and the possibility of opening up to aligning and then um, aligning alignment tasks of listening, uh, call and response to land, which means um, it is very using things like um, free form improvisation in responding. Um, it's actually being in land. So for example, being covered in earth being in the water, being in the thing, not just sort of like standing at the side and, and like just walking around. It's like being inside, digging, being in a, inside of the forest, being uh, in the water currents and, and on top of the mountain and elemental things. Um, that you're experiencing and and um, then then there's also uh, um, what comes out of that creatively and and then and then devising or allowing um, concepts to emerge in that way and I do a lot of um, indigenous hortic horticulture study, indigenous science study, um, which people might refer to as um, permaculture study, or sort of our ecological mindset of how we lived in with the world. Um, that is how we planted, how we understood um, the seasons, how we every, you know, so that becomes a part of the process. For me, it doesn't mean um, cultural practices. Like for, for me, it's not um, basket making or now we're going to do this task of now we're going to tan hides. Like that's that for me, that's my focus is on create, creative access inland with land as the collaborator. So it's basically a lot of shedding has to happen. And that's ha that it doesn't happen easily. It's a long-term process. Wow, that was beautiful, Santi. Um, and that helped me clarify, I think a little bit better um, how, uh, uh, from a previous conversation that we were having about the differences between land-based um, artistic practice. And uh, given the fact that we started by saying, you you know, we're all full of mud from digging in our gardens, I think this is a, this is a great, uh, great process. So how about you, Rafni? What's land-based practice mean to you? I was... Um... I was really struck by this question uh, when I was able to see it beforehand um, because uh, I was like, oh, the, the real answer for me comes from a very specific place. So what does land-based training mean to me as an indigenous person who was born and raised in a city in an urban environment mm -hmm. and in this context can't afford to leave. <laughs> like the, <laughs> what, what is my relationship to land-based practice, land-based training? 
under these circumstances and conditions. And so I thought about it a lot. Um, and I do think about it a lot, but having the question posed and thinking about like what I might say, I was like, oh, it, having the opportunity to acknowledge those, uh, those realities that I come from and the struggle of that and the difficulties of that, especially as, you know, someone who makes a lot of my um, work from performance and from, um, and from creation and those, and those types of things, my ability to uh, have access to land, like going home to our traditional territories in Northern Manitoba, you know, we haven't been able to do that in quite some time, um, especially with COVID because we don't want to go up to a remote place um, and potentially bring something with us. So it's like, those are conversations that, you know, my mother and I, my family and I had uh, over the past couple of years, but, but in general, I just kind of like wanted to take the opportunity to say, yeah, it's a tricky, it's a tricky relationship. And, and sometimes it's very, um, to me, it's, it's comforting to be able to talk about like the, the struggle of that, that it's like, it's this to, to be able to access the the water to be able to access just just a just a patch of grass <laughs> you know just something to connect me and ground me um so that I can um feel like I have a relationship with with that with that body of water so that I can have a relationship with these with these elements in this moment in time depending on what it is that I'm that I'm working on um I will say that memory like my memories and then genetic memory then also becomes super important within that practice and within that um training because it's like you know anytime I do have access anytime I do get to be um for example back back on our traditional lands it's like you just try to absorb everything every sensation as deeply as it could possibly go recording things taking videos so that it's like those memories those sense memories can I can carry with me when all of a sudden it's like okay well what I have access to is my living room okay what I have access to is a studio with a window that looks at some trees you know <laughs> that's when I'm more confined to um to places and spaces that are in the environment that I actually live in which is which is the city which is the place that you know I in this moment in time I'm like oh I have to be here I can't this is where this is where I'm at um and so and so yeah so that uh and then genetic memory of like reminding myself that those uh those ways of being those ways of knowing actually live inside of me um and that I do have access to those uh is a is, is very important so like listening to stories of my mother and my grandparents so story and memory become exponentially more important when my tactile relationship to the land is can be very limited End of thought. I just wanted to comment and say uh, absolutely, um, because um, even like, or er, say you, you're urban, you have access to only <laughs> concrete. <laughs> um, uh, if you had living, but even people living in the country, we've we've lost. Everybody has lost a lot of dis we're disconnected. So even if you're walking in the land, it's not, it's an intention. It's a, it, you know, so there is still work that needs to happen with people who are living right in the land. Um, that's my, my, but, but what I wanted to mention is absolutely right is that you, when you get those opportunities to, you have to hold it in the body and, and remember it because as an artist, um, when I do all of the land-based creation, I'm performing it in a theater. So I'm not performing it in the land. I have to bring all of that knowledge that I research that I've had, recall it, uh, visualize it, activate it, 
in a theater space. And I, so that's, a, for that's another total um, training process. How do you, how do you do that? <laughs> so, um, it, it, for me, that's very interesting. Um, and I feel like uh, as an individual artist, I can access very, very quickly that, and I can bring that forward in my performance. Um, and then when I, I just did uh, premiered um, Homelands in, a in April, and um, I bring um, uh, artists with me to the land. And I think it's important that they, they experience the land so that they can recall it uh in that process we talk about how do we how to remember when we were doing this and remember when we were in the water remember you know and the the quality of the water how what was the what was the um resistance that we needed and you know on and on and on to bring that into the into the work and um also, like I mentioned, I was, I'm working with all different artists um, and there's um, working with Irma Villafuerte, who's a dance artist and she, her home connection is El Salvador. Uh, so in, as an immigrant to Toronto, and then I'm working with also lots of um, immigrant displaced or displaced people or moved from their homelands where they don't have access to go back but they're here in Turtle Island. And um, what's, what we're kind of also just exploring is that the work that we're doing and the concepts works that we're doing here in Turtle Island is helping them to be connected here. But it, now as an artist, she's going back to El Salvador and using some of the techniques that we're in the, the intentions that we're doing here and applying it to when she's back into, um, working in the lands of El Salvador. So, so there's this sort of transference of knowledge that we hold in the body that we can recall. And, um, but it does take time to invest in that. And uh, I would say maturity as an artist. So I don't know how it would be for you know, like a really young <laughs> person to, you know, understand the concept and the, the, the intention of that, but you got to start somewhere. And that, that, could, that could be the new, the new way of, of acknowledging the importance of that training. And Rose, land-based training? Yes. Um... <clears throat> So one of the uh, first teachers I had um, with regard to that, and that's for me, was Edna, Edna Manitowabi, when I was at Native Theatre School in 1991. And, and, and you know, Edna was um, at the school as a... Um, also as a student. So um, it was, um, there, were, there was a lot of learning for me at that particular junction, juncture in my life with regard to Native Theater School and my involvement with it with, and, and all the things I learned from Edna at that time, but also And it was about listening. It was, and um, so that was 1991. And it was about listening. And then comes 2003, 2004, when, when I've invited Edna back to our school, um, when I'm now in the leadership of CIT, of taking our students through listening processes of the land and, and the, students who are with us and this is at summer school at Trent um, the students are from many different areas and it's still about listening it's still about listening because a lot of the students no matter where they're from um, 
they're they're displaced. They're always they're still displaced, whether they're living in in the city from if they're living in Edmonton or they're living in Calgary or if they're living in Vancouver or if they're living in Toronto or just off reserve, they're displaced. And so it's finding that that time and place uh, lying on the grass and just listening and finding a way to embody um, embody that 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 land and then and then Edna would bring that back into our studios in Toronto so I worked with Edna a lot in my first years um, with our students um, mostly because she had been a student herself and she had gone through something she hadn't gone through before um learning how to be on stage even though she, she was very involved with um cultural teachings she didn't know anything about being in the theater so she was um really important to me uh in my learning and and was a, a very um key person for me to involve with our our students in the beginning um, but there are several people who CIT has been involved with who have been so significant um, that brought I think some of Santee's, um, Santee talked about indigenous land sciences. I'm not sure what, what word <laughs> Santee used, but someone like Lenore Kishi Tobias worked with us for many years about land memory and the stories of the land and how the storytelling, how so many years of storytelling um, and they've discovered that those stories are actually true. They've gone back and the science shows that those stories are true. Um, the stories about Northern Ontario and the waterfalls. And so Lenore Kashig Tobias um, was really interesting in terms of land-based teachings and storytelling. Um, Blackfoot, Leroy Little Bear and Amethyst First Rider, but Leroy in particular, um, his science, the science of, of flux. And um, so this is land-based teachings, but it's scientific and it's cultural and it's actually quite, it's just so moving. Um, when you listen to these individuals talk about their land and the land memory and how that land memory affects us and how we affect the land. And this is at Lethbridge University. Like we're we're not we're not at ceremony. This is at Lethbridge University and he's talking to our students in a studio. Um, and I still think back at that that those times and how moving it was to, to listen to him uh, talk about these things and Lenore talk about our, to our students about where she's from. And then on another level, there's Leanne Simpson, whose work, um, her poetry, her film, and her relationship to her creation, her writing, and her work is so about where she's from. Um, and so these individuals, although they influence us, they influence the work that we do and, and how we try to, to train. Um, it, it's just an aspect that we are reminded how important our, our cultural memory is, but the land memory, like the land that we're on, 
has memory and um and how when you lie on that land and you listen to it if you give it that time you can hear what it has to say so personally um as an individual that has always been uh, very moving for me when I see artists put it into play it's extraordinary and uh, I'm always uh, I always love to witness it um, how do we incorporate that in <laughs> in our training well we we do our best but you know it, for everyone it training is training and sometimes people get it in you know three weeks and sometimes it takes four years for someone to go oh now I understand that you know um so for each individual it's a little different um but it's it is extraordinary when when uh individuals find their way through through that that knowledge and it's not a little thing it's huge and um so it, it is um it, it is step by step trying to find our way to get that knowledge um into our students under their skin Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you all. I want to um, just um, I like what you said, and I love Libra a little bear, and and I do when I do my cultural research, um, it's through language and the the intention of language, and then knowing language comes from land, uh, so it's all interwoven. It's all connected. So you kind of like open a little idea, but then it's. It could go on into that's why lifelong learning and that's why to understand the immensity of all of it is is um impossible <laughs> to understand the universe <laughs> um, so but what i wanted to mention is and it applies to training in terms of when we think about what is in indigenous training um the idea of mindset so mindset is really uh, fundamental to how we're working in our understanding. Um, the frame, the the line of thinking, uh, moving in relation is is uh, to know what that mindset is. And I think what people like uh, Dr. Leo Little Bear, they're talking about mindset. And, and when we understand the um, the different ways and the different nations that how we had a different reality and interconnection with nature. And for Ongwahoi people, it was very clear. Everything was related to the natural living universe of which we are a very small part. Um, so that takes take does take the study um, into into indigenous science, into um, our uh, practices of um, horticulture, and um, yeah. So I just wanted to say that that for me that's very interesting as an as a as a uh, question line of questioning is what was our what was our mindset, and it's quite different from you know, just uh, um, just walking through in our normal school education. And it, it, you know, like if you're just walking through and not questioning in that area, for example, um, when, I, when I was studying uh, Gaingeha, the language, it's um, fascinating to, know um, the philosophy of how we view the world and everything is um, movement based so we have a uh, verbing language 
it's metaphorical, it's not noun-based, which is, which is English. It is descriptive, but through movement. So I was like, oh, that's so interesting. But as a mover, as a dancer, that our, in the, the language really is, um, is all about movement and uh, different ways of understanding our relationship with, with the world. For example, um, and I, I, I know this by just studying with um, first language speakers, um, how we would say creation. Oh, I say that. No, we don't say like the creator, pre-colonial, it would be creation. Um, the creative spirit or that mystery is and um, when you break that all down and I'm not it kind of refers to um, move the movement of the immense creation so there's movement in it and the immensity of the the creative force the creative energy and then every single thing within Ongohoi, song, dance, story, ceremony, how we build, what we did, how we related to the land was to be in alignment with that immensity of creation. So we were always seeking that alignment. And so, so there's a lot of learning in the mindset learning or unlearning, what we say a lot to unlearning. Brilliant, brilliant, Santi. Yes, absolutely. I feel um, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> um, just listening to the three of you uh, talk about your relationship to creation. Absolutely, um, which is beautiful. And so here's a question that is kind of one that I'm excited to ask. And it's a tough one. I'm not expecting a, a, a yes or no answer. Um, but how do you each operate within the mainstream system in regards to working within the funding and granting application process, the evaluation process, and how, um, you know, the colonial framework defines value um, versus our own self-determined value? wants to start with this one well I, I will um well first of all because we're training and we're not we're not a theater company there's a lot of eyes on us and there's a lot of things we have to answer to and so there's a lot of hoops that we have to jump through. Um, our major funder is Canadian Heritage. Um, but, you know, we don't exist without all, the, all of that funding. You know, th those, that funding is completely necessary for us to exist. And um, so it is a, a dance. Uh, of answering to their uh, what qualifies us as as tra trainers, um, and then and then we have our own thing to answer to what qualifies us as indigenous an indigenous theater training institute. So um, there's the Canadian heritage or all the, all the, the bodies of in, uh, funders that we have to answer to. And then there's, we have to answer to our own um, you know, answer to who we say we are. And, and to our students, answer to our students. And 
to their funders from their reserves who are funding them. We have to answer to them. So, so it, it is a dance um, because they want results. The funders want results. They want to see our, that our students are working when they finish, when they finish school. What's your success stories? Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering the question yet, but I did want to, to just um, put those thoughts for, forward first and I'll, I'll join the conversation again in a minute, <laughs> later. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> um, in terms of granting, uh, we are creation production. So Kahawi Dance Theater has been around now going almost on 18 years. So we've gone from a very, you know, the evolution of the company started as me being the, um, artistic director, but didn't pay myself for five years, that kind of thing where you're just building, building the company. And I really was slowly able to get um, project funding and, and then slowly was able to get um, core funding from Canada Council, Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council, which is helps the company operate and then other initiative projects and, and things like that. Um, in terms of our training funding, which came from Canadian Heritage, we got cut from that in 2017 because we weren't able to fulfill those um, statistical um, benchmarks and as a very small organization in in, in um, competition with people like the National Ballet School or Toronto Dance Theatre where they're able to track that um, and have the administrative capacity to do that work. So when we lost that little bit of funding for our four week training program, that's when I stopped doing the training because we didn't have access to funding. Um, and try to keep that investigation and turn it into professional development. So what I kept out of the training that we did is the creation lab. So I consistently do a creation lab every year, which sometimes defending funding ranges from a week to two weeks. So this year's creation lab will be on land. It's called inviting the land to shape us. And it'll be on the Swega Six Nations from August 1st to 13th. Um, but in terms of um, just in general working within that system, and I've, I've learned um, over the years that um, we have to be very uh, clear about what, what you're trying to accomplish. For example, very simple thing like, oh, I want to create a dance. It's not just about, I want to create a dance. For Indigenous artists, it's, well, how are we going to create that dance? We want to do it through an Indigenous process. What is that Indigenous process? So it's almost two things at once. It's not just, I'm going to do this product to get this dance out. It's really, um, working through a lot of that research. That's for me personally. Um, so having to describe that in detail and almost having to over describe cultural concepts that you know a jury might not even have any understanding of. So for, for um, and I know that some juries don't, whoever is on the jury doesn't have the cultural context to evaluate very well. Um, so that just leads me to think that I have to be over um, 
Well, just to be very clear on, on what it is that we're trying to accomplish and sort of like spell it out as clear as possible. Um, that's all I can say for now. I um as as someone who isn't a part of a of like a, a body, an organization, a company, as an individual, um I try to have these conversations as often as possible where I'm checking in with people that I consider mentors and friends. Um because it can get kind of lonely as like the individual who is going from project to project, uh, whether it's as a performer or as a, or as an, as an educator from contract to contract, like the, the simple explanation is how do I operate within the mainstream systems? I just work. <laughs> I take work and I work. Um, and, um, and through those different experiences. I tried to carry all the things that we've talked about previously with me. Um, my relationship to land, my values, my teachings, my medicines, and I carry it. I carry that with me. And it's easy, especially as like the, I'm thinking especially more as like a, as a performer, just going into a space, taking a job, taking a contract, the very like, uh, you know, nuts and bolts of, of, of what it means to be like a, a working performer in the year 2023. Um, I've learned how to uh, negotiate how much of my, um, for what I'll, I'll call my creative spirit, I'm willing to kind of offer up depending on what I'm working on, because oftentimes like uh, working, um, with you know some non-indigenous folk where it's like if all of a sudden as one of the few indigenous people in the room uh you are thrust into positions of authority or or to answer to things and all of a sudden i'm like oh how did i end up here um <laughs> so like the lessons of learning how to negotiate those spaces and and remind myself um of what my capacities are so kind of going back to like letting go of the pressure of time, also uh, being very uh, diligent about protecting my sense of balance in work um, and things that will uh, nourish my creative spirit and working with um, folks and, and, uh, and, uh, and on projects that I feel will encourage and nurture that. Um, and just trying to be as mindful as I possibly can while trying to keep a roof over my head, uh, which is, you know, easier, easier said than done. But like, I also have a part time job at a bakery because I know that some days like for this month of June, it's like, oh, I, I, I have a I have a simple, straightforward job. So instead of having to like uh, clamor or feel like I'm falling behind, I get to have a moment where it's like I'm doing this job that's not necessarily cr the most creatively fulfilling but it's given me an opportunity to rest and reset which are also parts of artistic practice that are very easily set aside for for myself and are definitely values of mine and things that i've been taught um but that are easy to forget, especially in working in an industry that is very product driven, that is very um, hustly and bustly. Uh, so yeah, the, that and the lifelong learning, but it's like not getting, um, not getting caught up in the feeling that I'm, that I'm falling behind, reminding myself that, that everything is a lifelong learning process and um, and trying my best to carry those things with me from space to space uh, so that I can do work and create work that is embodied and healthy. Those are, I think, the two things that I've had the most focus on in the past couple of years because I'm still trying to figure out what that means, how I can tell stories that are 
personal and are coming from sensitive places, um, but that still feel, uh, that still keep me connected to, to the earth and aren't going to hurt me as a performer more than it's going, more than what I hope it will impart onto others. End of thought. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, I have so many questions about the extent of compromise that you each feel you have to give in the industry on a on a regular basis, um, and 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 how much you know coming back to unlearning um, and decolonizing as much as that's used to the brain, um, you know, to uh, to rework to a point of being able, as you were saying, Santi, to um, define in the English language what it is we want to do and how we do it, because it's not a, la a language that actually describes Indigenous ways in any in any. <laughs> so it's there's a real misstep um, already um, in filling in applications or going through an evaluation process um, or providing the statistics. Um, it's uh, it is it is an ebb and flow game that that is played um, within this ecology in this sector. Um, and I think we're we're down to about five minutes now. So um, if there's anybody in the audience that has a question for our group, um, this is now the time to ask. Um, I've got one more question if nobody's putting their hand up um, that I can ask and I, I'd like you to and this is a short answer hopefully and it's a question that I'd like you to think about answering four years ago versus today and that is can Indigenous training or the creative process exist without technology and I'm thinking more of the Zoom and the interactive that we now basically live off of. What would you have said four years ago versus today about that? How has this technology changed your practice? I'll go. Um, uh, four years ago, I would say uh, we don't need technology. And today I would say we don't need technology. <laughs> because where one of my times, um, when I work here in Oshwigan, we have a very poor Wi-Fi. So when I'm working in the studio here, I don't have Wi-Fi access. Um, and um, sometimes I've been good at this spot right here for my Zoom, so that, that's been helpful. Um, but when I go to say work in um, my home territory in Upper State New York, uh, there, where I work, um, there is no um, TV, there's no Wi Fi, there's no phone access. So I'm off grid. I'm off grid there. And um, at the very first time that I went, I was like, oh, um, for three days it was strange. For three days I was like reaching for my phone that didn't work in my pocket <laughs> it was like oh and that's what I talk about of the de the shedding part you wouldn't believe how instinctively you're just reaching for your phone and I didn't couldn't use it and I thought oh wow yikes that's gonna be really um am I always gonna but it sh it went away it disappeared that need and that was that was really comforting to me that I could just let that go if if there was a thing like an apocalypse or something we didn't have these things we would very soon let that go um and then when i when we work we we don't uh we're working the land we basically want to be off grid and when people are coming to work with me i let them know well there's no access to wi-fi and it's it's not about that
intros. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'm technology challenged. So uh, I often wish that we didn't have to use technology at all because um, it's <laughs> I'm always having to be retrained or someone show me again how to do things. Um, so um, even four years ago, I would have said, I wish we didn't have to use technology. Um, but even four years ago, we were very dependent on it um, for um, many areas of our training. Um, so um, Terry, repeat the question again for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just, you know, can training and the creative process exist without technology? So I would say, yes, it can, it must, um, it absolutely must. Um, it starts, it starts without it. It has to start without it. It has to start with the, the your, your little morsel inside. Um, none of the training works if it doesn't start from the spark inside. So, um, so absolutely, I agree. Yes, training can exist without technology. Um, absolutely. Um, so, um, all you need is the spark and some space and the willingness to learn. And, um, and that's, and that's for all cultures, right? Ours, anyone's culture, it, it demands the spark and the willingness to learn. So no matter who you are, where you're from, uh, if you want to know something and you want to learn something, um, that desire has to, to be first and foremost. And um, it demands sacrifice. Um, it it doesn't it's not instant and um, we live in a uh, in a world where people want things instant but um, it, it it is it isn't instant so people need to make sacrifices uh, to be an artist and um so that's one of the things that I try to educate our students about is that because some of them are already instant stars on technology. Um, some of our hip hop dancers are really well known in the um, in that online online world, and um, but it doesn't last forever. When you're an artist, we really need to to find your way through that, and um, and not that I discourage what they have on their online world, but I do encourage them going deeper and learning how to move deeper and more well-rounded as dancers, and. Um, and where to go next from us, because we're just a stepping stone. Um, and CIT is a stepping stone um, for actors as well. You know, it's some actors, some of our students come with not even having any idea what they want to do, but it's a stepping stone to um, something bigger and better for themselves. So it's the same thing with dance. You, if you want to dance, um, you need to um, go deeper than just uh, TikTok. Well said, Rose. <laughs> Brafney? 
I will very quickly say to uh, to wrap up that creating without technology is a gift and a privilege and creating with technology is also a gift and a privilege without and with come with their own um come with their own gifts i think brilliant <laughs> well i cannot thank the three of you enough for sharing your experiences and your thoughts um, and your wisdom today with everyone who joined us uh, we had a very good audience uh, out there a, a lot of names uh, that i recognize and and so i'm great that everyone was uh was gifted with your conversation today and sharing about uh, training and professional development and spaces. So uh, on behalf of the Arts Build team, I just want to say again, Yawagoa, thank you all so much for joining us today and, uh, and take care. Enjoy the rest of your week. And thank you all for coming as well in the audience. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>